My name is Natalia Tretikova. I am a distinguished McKnight University professor at the Department of Medicinal Chemistry and the Cancer Center at the University of Minnesota. We are fortunate to have NIH funding for five major projects. The main project uh, that has traditionally been the focus of my lab is investigation of the chemical modifications of DNA. Over our lifetimes, we as humans are exposed to thousands of endogenous chemicals formed as products of normal cell metabolism and inflammatory response, and also exogenous molecules found in our diet, environment, therapeutic treatments, and consumer products. Many of these molecules or their metabolic products are inherently electrophilic and can engage in chemical reactions with cellular DNA. Such reactions form structurally modified DNA nucleobases known as DNA addicts. DNA addicts or lesions play a key role in chemical carcinogenesis because of their ability to induce heritable mutations by causing polymerase errors during DNA replication. Such mutations, if found in genes controlling cell growth and proliferation, can lead to cancer. So how do the structurally modified bases cause mutations? During normal DNA replication, bases are added to the growing chain of DNA with very high accuracy, according to the Watson-Crick base pairing rules. So A is opposite T and G opposite C. However, because their molecular shape and hydrogen bonding properties differ from those of native bases, DNA addicts may not obey the Watson-Crick base pairing rules. And this can cause misinsertion of incorrect nucleotide into the growing chain of DNA. For example, guanine typically pairs with cytosine through complementary hydrogen bonding. But if the post-exposition position of guanine is alkylated, this hydrogen bonding pattern is affected. As a result, post-exalkyl guanine prefers to pair with T, leading to G to T mutations. Studies in our laboratory employed the tools of organic synthesis and mass spectrometry and NMR to identify many novel DNA modifications induced by chemical carcinogens and chemotherapeutic drugs. However, the ability of such lesions to induce mutations during, a, during DNA biosynthesis is unknown. So what we do in this project is we use organic synthesis to synthesize non-canonical DNA bases and nucleosides that are formed as a result of chemical exposure. We then use solid phase synthesis to generate small pieces of DNA containing this unnatural nucleobases. We then use the tools of molecular biology to incorporate the synthetic DNA into cellular DNA. Then we can work with cell culture to investigate the outcomes of these chemical modifications in cells. So this work enables us to understand the chemistry of DNA damage and also the mechanisms of how it affects the cellular function, such as DNA replication, transcription, and to establish repair mechanisms of such damaged bases. In the second project, we're focusing on the origins of inter-individual differences in cancer. So, for example, in people who smoke, there is a large difference in lung cancer incidence between different ethnic groups. African-American smokers and native Hawaiians are at much higher risk for development of lung cancer as compared to um, Latino and European Americans. So we hypothesize that these differences in lung cancer risk originate from genetic and epigenetic differences uh, that are observed between these ethnic racial groups. So we are using the tools of analytical chemistry and epigenetics and also genetics, such as uh, genome-wide association studies, to understand how these different ethnic groups metabolize tobacco carcinogens differently, leading to much higher risk in specific groups of individuals compared to others. This is very important because we want to understand which smokers are at high risk for the development of lung cancer so that these individuals can be targeted for uh, smoking cessation and chemoprevention therapies. 
In the third project, we are focusing on epigenetics. This is a relatively new area in my laboratory. We just published the first big paper in our Nature Scientific Reports. And there we investigate a DNA methylation and demethylation. DNA methylation occurs primarily at cytosine bases of DNA and is used to silence uh, genes so that the patterns of gene expression can be established. So we know what proteins introduce methylation marks. Those are DNA methyltransferases. But for many years it wasn't known what proteins remove the epigenetic mark, this methylation mark from DNA, enable us to turn the genes back on. So it was found that 1011 translocation dioxygenases play a very important role in oxidizing the methyl group within DNA to hydroxymethyl C, formyl C, and carboxyl C. And then this oxidized forms are recognized as DNA damage and are removed by DNA repair machinery. So this enables these genes to be activated by removing a repressive mark. So we are focusing on TET proteins. There are actually three of them, TET1, TET2, and TET3. And these are metalloproteins that use alpha-ketoglutarate cofactor to oxidize the methyl groups in DNA. So we want to understand the roles of these oxidized bases in DNA by uh, conducting chemical proteomics experiments to identify specific readers of this hydroxymethylated, formulated, and carboxylated cytosines in DNA. And also we are looking in animal models to understand the effects of inflammation on epigenetic marks. So we have a large grant from the NIH to understand how epigenetics provides a link between inflammation and cancer. DNA methylation patterns in cells are regulated by the opposing activities of DNA methyltransferases, which introduce the methyl groups on cytosine, and TET dioxygenases, which remove the methylation marks. The methylation patterns are quite stable in healthy cells but can be deregulated in many human diseases, including cancer, inflammatory diseases such as asthma, and neurological conditions. Traditional anti-cancer therapies work by killing cancer cells. However, any cancer cells that survive treatment can develop resistance. Unlike permanent genetic mutations, epigenetic marks are reversible and therefore the epigenomes of cancer cells can be reprogrammed to behave more like normal cells, and epigenetic errors can be corrected with proper therapies. Epigenetic inhibitors can be used alone or in combination with traditional chemotherapies. Our laboratory specifically is focusing on the development of TET inhibitors. All known inhibitors of TET mimic the alpha-ketoglutarate cofactor, and they are not specific for TET because they will inhibit any alpha-ketoglutarate-dependent enzymes in cells, potentially having significant side effects. We employed structure-based design to develop molecules that will simultaneously bind to the substrate binding site and the cofactor binding site. As you can see in this figure, the mimic of a substrate is shown in red and the alpha-ketoglutarate structural mimic is shown in blue. These two moieties are connected by a flexible linker that was optimized using molecular dynamic simulation. The molecules designed on the computer were then synthesized in the lab and tested using biochemical assays employing recombinant TET proteins. Molecules that showed activity in the biochemical assay are now being tested in human cell culture, and the most promising candidate will be evaluated in animal studies. Our hope is that this research will generate molecules that can be used as both biological probes of TET activity and also as a starting point for future therapeutic agents for cancer. In our fourth project, we investigate DNA protein cross-linking. So in the presence of B-selectrophiles or free radicals, proteins can become irreversibly trapped on DNA. 
So we are interested in this process because formation of such DNA protein crosslinks appears to be associated with aging. So we know that as uh, we age, specifically in the heart and in the brain, there is an increase in the number of DNA protein crosslinks. So my project that is actually a collaboration with Colin Campbell in uh, pharmacology, it aims to understand how this DNA protein crosslinks form and how they're handled by cells and how maybe when this repair process fails, it could lead to aging and other diseases. Very recently, with the COVID pandemic influencing the world, we also became engaged in investigation of potential inhibitors of COVID RNA polymerases. So our lab is known for um, our ability to synthesize uh, unnatural nucleosides. And so we are making analogs of remdesivir, which is one of the therapeutic agents that's currently been investigated for treatment of COVID. And we are um, using the tools of molecular modeling, organic synthesis, and also biochemical assays to test the activity of these analogs in human cells. SARS-CoV-19 virus is a single-stranded RNA virus that uses RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to replicate its genome. Viral polymerases can be inhibited by unnatural nucleoside analogs. For example, adenosine analog remdesivir has shown promising efficacy against SARS-CoV-19. However, the development of resistance to remdesivir is likely due to the high mutability of the viral genome. In collaboration with Courtney Aldrich at Minnesota and Susie Broyd at NYU, we employed structure-based design to develop a range of remdesivir analogs as potential future antiviral agents. Once the library of analogs is prepared, it is tested for antiviral activity using a biochemical assay developed in our laboratory. In this assay, a primer bearing a radioactive tag is extended in the presence of viral RNA polymerase. When inhibitor is active, this extension is inhibited and we can see the activity of potential molecules. The most promising candidates from biochemical assay will be tested in human cells infected with SARS-CoV-19 virus. So what kind of links this uh, different projects is our expertise in nucleic acid chemistry and also in mass spectrometry. My laboratory has two powerful mass spectrometers. One is a Quantiva triple quadrupole mass spectrometer and the second one is a Q-exactive orbit trap mass spectrometer that allows us for uh, accurate mass determination and very high resolution analysis of biomolecules and small molecules. So each student who joins the lab has the opportunity to learn uh, hands-on how to operate this instrumentation and all of them apply mass spectrometry in their research. My laboratory is probably a right fit for someone who wants to use the tools of chemistry and biology to be able to achieve a specific research goal. So we don't limit ourselves to just making a compound or just doing the biological studies. We are able to combine this two so the trainee uh, can experience organic synthesis, solid phase synthesis, uh, work with cell culture in animals and also be engaged in human studies all in one project. I think that's pretty unique. And so if, if that's something you are interested in, I hope you'll consider my group.